Hey, what's up, everybody? We have a new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe right now. Leave a comment on the video. Share it with your friends. It's also a podcast. Three and out. Wherever you listen with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify, we have you covered. As well as thevolume.com. We have merch. Check out. I got three and out hats right now. Thevolume.com. Search the podcast. Buy some merch. Okay, Middlecoff mailbag time. You guys know the drill. DMs wide open at John Middlecoff Instagram. Fire in those messages. Start with Mitchell. Mailbag question. The Trey Lance experiments obviously failed. But as a concept, athletic quarterback boosting an already high floor Shanahan system. Is it a good one? If we theoretically drop Josh Allen onto the Niners, do both Allen and the offense as a whole actually get better? Or would they sacrifice the timing that makes them special to accommodate the other? If the 49ers had Josh Allen, they would 100% have a Super Bowl, if not multiple. I mean, they made it to the NFC Championship with a banged-up Jimmy Garoppolo a couple years ago. So I, I don't even think it's a question mark. That if Would the 49ers want Josh Allen? 100%. He actually, specifically Josh Allen, I think is a big reason that they drafted Trey Lance. The problem with Trey Lance is his athleticism actually isn't that great. He didn't run very fast when you watched him run. He was a hesitant runner. His play speed wasn't great. So, like, Purdy is a more functional athlete on the field. And look what he's done for the Niners. He made some huge plays with his legs in the playoffs and over the course of his career. So, yeah, I mean, to me, Josh Allen is easily the second-best quarterback in the NFL. Uh, What about Joe Burrow? Yeah, we'll see how he comes back from injury. But, yes. The answer is yes. (laughs) Packer fan here from Ireland. Maybe it is, actually. Over the last few years in the NFL, it seems like there is always a new story about some shitty owner ruining their team. I wonder how much the Packers' sustained success over the decades comes down to its unique corporate structure as the ho- uh, having one unpredictable guy in charge. I understand a great deal of success comes from back-to-back great quarterbacks, but you could make the argument that the owners would have flat out overruled Ted Thompson and Goody and refused to move on. I don't think you can make that argument. I I think we would all agree. There is no chance that they trade Brett Favre. And after the MVPs trading Aaron Rodgers, because one thing the owner would have done is attempt to facilitate an improved relationship. So when it comes to those specific situations, one million percent, it has benefited the Packers because the football people with no influence from the money got to influence the right football decision. It's very rare, very rare that that was a, that was a Trent Baalke, excuse me, a little burp, uh, not a fart like he had the other day in his press conference. Didn't even skip a beat either is Robert Kraft is a complete outlier that he basically let Belichick, well, he kind of overruled him with Jimmy Garoppolo, and then he let him make the decision. I guess actually it's happened before. I mean, Bill Walsh traded Joe Montana. Uh, Holian, I guess it was Grigson when they cut, but it was really the owner when they cut Peyton Manning. It's a very tough decision. It, it, it really is. Because you get a transcendent player, the popularity they have in the league at that position, the popularity they have for the business of your football team. Uh, But the Packers are a great example. If you trust your football people, let them cook. And then just enjoy the dinner. Thoughts on the Jets pick at number 10. Do they take a tackle that probably won't start until someone gets hurt? Or do they take the best pass catcher available, which is probably... Bowers. Well, I said it in the mock draft. I think they would pass on a tackle. And a lot of people in the NFL believe that too. Because in fairness to their thinking, if, again, big if, 
capital letters I, capital letter F. Your two tackles stay healthy, and you draft a tackle, and he can't really play guard. That guy wouldn't play much at all. So all of a sudden, you've used this high-valued asset. Pretty sure they don't have a second-round pick because the Packers have it, and you don't get anything out of it. Win now mode. I think Bowers their pick, unless Bowers is off the board. Fugazi, we'll get to the Fugazi. I probably have to skip it this week because of the uh, because of the draft, but we will get back to it next week. This is the golf podcast, but it's about Tiger Woods, so I'll answer it. What would Tiger have shot at Augusta had he been able to use a cart? Would he have been competitive? Well, Augusta doesn't let you use carts. So any other course, it, that that would work, but there's just no golf carts at Augusta. So hypothetically thinking, yes, he would play better. As someone who's walked a little bit, in golf, when I'm trying to get back in shape, especially in the summer, it takes a little bit out of you. Now, granted, you know, me or you are carrying our own bag or pushing your own bag. A little different when you have a caddy. But still, a lot of wear and tear on those legs that are fused together. As a fellow millennial, 38, your perspective on sports, life, finance, I think I answered this question. Maybe not. I grinded it out in a shitty industry for 10 years, making no money, and then took the skills I developed and jumped into the tech industry. Six years later, I'm making four times what I used to make and haven't looked back. Congratulations, Colby. Awesome to hear. Keep up the fresh takes. Okay, on to the mailbag. What would be required to make a small market team like the Panthers into a major player? I know the owner kind of sucks, but does the smaller market make it inherently more difficult to attract high-end free agent talent? Or does money ultimately talk in the eyes of players? And second, when scouting college players, how much does the rest of the team factor in to the process? For example, big SC fan here, South Carolina, and saw firsthand Rattler and Xavier Leggett carry a truly bad team. On your first question, if you're really good and you have star player like you once did with Cam Newton, you guys were a major player. I mean, you guys were playing on prime time, uh, Sunday night football, Monday night football. The Panthers with Cam Newton and the good years mattered in the NFL. The market size doesn't dictate. Th this is not basketball where the NBA is kind of screwed because Curry got bounced after a playing game and LeBron's going to get swept in four. The equivalent in football, if OKC was the one seed, it would be, it doesn't matter. We watch. I'm not watching OKC, right? I'll watch the Lakers, and I have. Even the Knicks Sixers. You couldn't pay me to watch some of these other series. In football, the Chiefs aren't a big market. They get Mahomes. They get Andy Reid. They become immediately a major player. The Packers for decades, Favre, Rodgers, now Jordan Love, major player. You guys, Cam Newton, major player. If Bryce Young becomes a star, you'll be a major player. When it comes to the money on free agents, for the most part, star players don't really hit free agency. So, like, you're not really missing out that often on guys, I would say, if you don't quote-unquote sign a guy. But the, the NFL money talks. Guys are going to go where the most money is offered. Your market size is irrelevant. Rattler... And uh, the wide receiver definitely factor in the team, right? I think sometimes you're more critical when a guy's on a really good team. You kind of nitpick him. Like, God, he should have done more of this and that. When a guy excels on a team that is the underdog in the majority of the games you're playing, right? Like, think of who you're the underdog against. Clemson, Georgia, Tennessee, uh Bama, LSU, any of those teams, if you play Ole Miss, yeah, it 100% factors in. And it's hard. I mean, you got to, this is why you got to know as a scout or a college scouting director, the, the conferences and the talent on all the teams really well. Because to, uh, I would say, dissect that stuff, 
you can't have surface knowledge, right? You follow South Carolina football, right? So you have a really good idea of your team. And if you've been following them long enough, you've seen good and bad teams, right? With Spurrier, you, you know what it looks like. And then you definitely know what it looks like because you play arguably the best team in the country every single year in Georgia. Your rival is Clemson, who's been one of the best teams in the country for a decade. So you got a pretty good feel. So like if I'm the West Coast scout, I might not know the SEC inside and out. So it's if I'm just watching a player, I can evaluate that player, his skills, but his competition, it can be a little more difficult. There's a lot of context in college scouting. But that, that's what makes it difficult. Like a guy, if I play at, let's just pick a school, Oklahoma, and I'm a pass rusher, and I have 10 sacks in a season, and I'm coming out. I have 10 sacks, and I'm one of the better, more productive pass rushers in the conference. Well, what if five of those sacks came in non-conference games against non-Power 5 opponents? And three of those five sacks came against a D1 double A team. And when I played two teams in our conference, Texas and let's just say Kansas State, and they both have an, a draftable tackle, and I went against both those guys and I was not productive, that's where you really got to kind of nitpick it. And it, it, it's hard. And then you got to figure out, is it like, does he have the skills to translate? Is he taking advantage of shittier competition. It's why the SEC is relatively easy to evaluate. Like if you're doing it on a weekly basis, you're just seeing them constantly against NFL teams or NFL players, right? You're like, well, that guy's a second rounder. This week he's going up against a fourth rounder. Last year he smoked the dude. That guy went in the second round. Or that guy kicked his ass and that dude was a top 10 pick. So you can kind of put all the context, the pieces of the puzzle together. That's kind of what you're attempting to do. The 82 game preseason is in the books and it's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JOHN New customers bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code J-O-H-N, John, only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. I'm listening to your most recent mailbag and currently hearing you talk about choosing between an O-lineman and a wide receiver. You said if an O-lineman and a wide receiver were the same grade, you would choose the lineman every single time. That had me reflecting on the 21 draft when the Bengals selected Jamar Chase over Panay Sewell. I know Burrow suggested to the organization that they draft Chase, who was his college teammate and good buddy, but do you think the Bengals now look back and regret the decision, especially considering Burrow's injury concerns? I don't think they regret it at all. I think we all agree Jamar Chase is the top two or three wide receiver in the NFL. And yeah, I think you would rather have Jamar Chase than not. I like Panesul. He's a good player. But I think if you just said, who would you rather have in that scenario for that team, you would take Chase. Now, if you look at the, would the, the Lions trade Sewell for Chase? Probably not. I, I think it kind of depends. I, I think Chase has a chance to be a Hall of Famer. And Panay Sewell doesn't. So I think you could argue, should they are they the same grade as a player? Now, if you told me I got Trent Williams or Jamar Chase, Tyron Smith coming out of college, all these guys, yeah. If I'm just getting a starter offensive lineman, I think the way you would look at it like this, the Chargers are a good example. If you think Marvin Harrison and Joe Alt are both going to be Pro Bowl level players, obviously if you do, one guy turns out to be one of the greatest of all time, you would rather take that guy. But if you just view those guys as the same, and especially Harbaugh, you just take him. Meaning the alignment. So maybe I contradicted myself a little bit there because I said the Bengals would take Chase. But I don't think Panay Sewell, who is good, uh, I, I think the Bengals feel pretty good about that one.
Are we sure Robert Kraft is an elite owner? I'm not saying he's a bum, but people forget that before Brady and Bill, he was known for constant meddling. Furthermore, he ran two Hall of Fame coaches, Parcells, Pete Carroll, out of town. And later, after going to the playoffs two of three years, Kraft didn't meddle when Belichick wanted to keep Brady as a starter in 01. But after that, we give him credit for not meddling when the Pats were going to the Super Bowl basically every other year. Not exactly a difficult task. If the team isn't in the conference championship, he gets extremely hands-on. What are your thoughts on Robert Jonathan Kraft as owners in 2024? Can you describe what makes an elite owner? And are there any sub-500 teams that you would say have elite ownership? I think the key to any owner, the number one key to a good owner, hire and pay a premium for you. Try to hire the best people possible and then don't do anything beside the business side of the team. When you start getting involved, and there's a difference, like a guy hits his girlfriend, like, hey, we're cutting this guy and the coach doesn't want, I have no problem with that. I'm talking about being in the draft room, like Jonathan Kraft currently is with Elliot Wolf, and like giving his feedback on what he wants to do. I think that is a recipe for a fucking disaster. We saw it with Dan Snyder for 20 years. We see it happening with David Tepper right now, telling them what plays to run. Jimmy Haslam was way too involved. You know who's actually a pretty good owner? <laughs> You're gonna in terms of Mark Davis. You get hired, you get to do whatever you want, which is a coach's and GM's dream. Now, part of also being a good owner is hiring the right people. And you could argue he has not done that. But you go work for him, you get to do whatever you want. You work for Jonathan Kraft right now, no chance. So I'm with you. Like, he owned the team during that period of time. But he's constantly, and I'm putting this more on Jonathan than Robert, because Robert's 82 years old or whatever now. I think Jonathan wants to play GM. I think Jonathan's been dreaming about this day since the moment he could kick Bill out of the building. Then I get to run the show. And look what they did. Elliot Wolf, longtime personnel guy, son of Ron Wolf, one of the most legendary GMs in the history of the league. You think Elliot Wolf's in charge? Fuck no. He's doing whatever Jonathan tells him to do or has to run it by him. That's why Diana Rossini, I listened to her talk on the podcast saying when you talk to other GMs, they say that Jonathan Kraft's the guy running the show. And I think where they find that out is they ask Elliot, hey, would you be interested in this? What about this? What about this deal? He's like, I got to run it by Jonathan. And listen, there's nothing wrong with like running something by your owner when you're making a big trade or a big signing, but it does feel like he wants to be the grand poobah. So it's one of the reasons that I'm shorting the Patriots for the foreseeable future. Coward once said, after Stafford won the Super Bowl, Stafford doesn't get the respect he deserves because he stayed in Detroit too long. I agree. Do you agree? I think if Matt Stafford would have played for a winning franchise during the bulk of his career, I think we would talk about him like we talk about Josh Allen and Joe Burrow. I don't know if we would have ever been considered the top dog because of Manning and Brady and Rodgers, but I think he would have been constantly considered a top five quarterback. And I would say for the most part, he never was considered that. You know his number one supporter over the years? Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers constantly talked him up. Why? Play in the same division, and when you're studying your divisional opponents, you just watch their games. Well, who do you think he saw a ton on cross tape over a decade? Matt Stafford. And he's thinking, God, guy kind of looks like me. So, yes, I agree. The good thing for Stafford is he's made $250 million. So, Super Bowl champion, one of the richest guys in league history. Say it all worked out for him. It's to the point where I can't even watch some of these other shows because their analysis is so bombastic and lazy. 
just for hot takes. Question. What about Antonio Pierce as a leader is so, I don't even know what word he's shooting for here, so specific? It seems like the players are outspokenly committed to him more than what we've seen with most coaches. Well, I think, I I, I mean, I've never, I don't know the guy, but I, I think he was a team captain level guy as a player, as a middle linebacker. So when you play middle linebacker, when you play free, free safety, when you play quarterback, and you're like the one of the leaders of the team, you just have some natural ability to connect with people on and off the field. Obviously, in the NFL, you got to be a really good player to be, you know, not just a team captain, starter, and then on a really good team. Well, he was that level guy on a really good team under a really good coach. So... I would imagine, if I had to guess, Antonio Pierce, who played under Tom Coughlin, has a good balance of being really intense and holding people to a high standard, but then just relating to guys. Like, that's what good coaches are able to do. They're able to form a powerful relationship. I saw this thing that went viral from Dan Quinn uh, in a team meeting with his coaches. And basically what he said is I need all you guys to form good relationships with your players. Because when you have a good relationship with the guy you're coaching, you can coach him harder. Which is just kind of common sense, right? Why can your parents ride you more than some random person on the street? Have a lot of equity with those people. Why can Andy Reid and Travis Kelsey shove each other on the sideline and he's coached them for a decade so when you know a guy intimately as a with a relationship no different than your friends from high school or college as you get older your relationship with those individuals are just kind of unique you have a lot of built up just personal equity and knowledge of these people and essentially what dan quinn's saying is like get to know these guys and i think antonio pierce has a natural ability of connecting with guys. That's going to be the least of his worries. He's good at that. Clearly. It's going to be running the team, which is clearly a really, really hard thing to do on Sundays in the sport of football, <laughs> right? Cause it's the game becomes a little less about that on Sunday and more about we're playing chess and he has to coach the coaches from a chess standpoint, how do we focus on the weaknesses, the strengths? I'll give him credit. He brought Marvin Lewis, who's his boy, longtime head coach, Tom Coughlin. Like these guys are surrounding him. I'm always impressed when impressive people like a certain individual. That's why I bought into Dan Campbell. It's like, wait, Sean Payton loved this guy for this guy was assistant head coach. Parcells was the guy that drafted this guy and got him into coaching. Here's an interesting question for you. How do teams evaluate front office talent? It seems as though organizations that continuously go through brain drains still hold up over time. Ravens, Eagles, Niners, do they know how to develop scouts and analysts better, or do they simply get better people to come work for them through reputation and higher salaries? Combination of both. Obviously, if you're willing to pay the most, you can steal the best talent. Like if Google, Facebook, Apple, they want a top engineer, they can outbid any company. If Howie Roseman wants to get the cream of the crop, he did this years ago with Joe Douglas, Andrew Barry, he will cut a check from Jeffrey Lurie. I think the Ravens are a good example of, and I, I talked to uh, Darius Hayward Bay, who now works for them, they have a culture of what they look for, of how the front office works. And it's been like that for 25 years. So if you go there to work, they teach you what to do. And you either shape in or shape out. And we've seen a ton of guys over the years shape in and become very, very successful organizations. Same thing the Niners are doing now. 
It starts at the top and then it bleeds down and you teach what you want, what you look for, uh, the type players we like, what's expected of you. It's very, very clear. So there's not a guessing game. And I think a lot of teams don't have any identity. All, all football programs, college and pro, say the same shit. Want tough, hard-nosed guys that love ball. Family, faith, and football. I mean, everyone says we want we want tough guys, guys that are passionate. Football's life. It's like, yeah, we, we get that. But do you know the actual players to look for that actually have that? Because the Ravens have figured that out over the years. Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch have a pretty good idea. Right? How he learned this from Andy, a lot of emphasis on the line of scrimmage. And if you just build up the line of scrimmage, defensive and offensive line, for the most part, you're going to be competitive. So I, I think, like, let's use the Panthers as an example and the Browns for years. You just run through people and run through ideas. Like, what does your organization stand for? Beside, like, God, family, football. There's not, like, a clear identity. The Ravens have had two guys running the organization, and Ozzy's still there for since the 90s. DaCosta has been there forever. He worked under Ozzy for all that time. Packers are a good example. Pretty sure Brian Gutekinds has been with the Packers for a long, long time. From Ron to Ted to Goot. It's like their identity hasn't changed. Philosophically, they have an idea of exactly what they're looking for. I think a lot of these teams are just constantly kind of trying to reinvent the wheel, starting from scratch. It's not really how it works. And part of it, you got to be willing to go through some tough times if you ha- if you believe in the vision. And this probably works at any walk of life in terms of an industry. If you're constantly changing management, we're all different humans. We all have different beliefs. But any organization that's able to hire from within, promote from within, because you're able to train those guys. It's why Bill's coaches were so successful for him. They all started at the bottom, in the mailroom. He taught them everything they needed to know. So by the time they became coordinators or college directors or you know the G- his GM and Casario or whatever, they knew exactly what he wanted. So it was all like one vision. There wasn't any guessing games. How many times... In your office or your job, when positions change and new ownership or new management, and and no one's on the same page. It's like, what are we doing? And everyone below the top guy is like, this doesn't make any sense. No one says that with the Ravens when they change from Ozzy to uh, to DaCosta. Because nothing changed. Obviously, he's a different human. But pretty clear, you just watch their team. It looks exactly the same. So I I think part of it, and look at Andy and Veach. I, I think there's just a clear vision of what is needed. And everyone's on the same page. I think that goes a long, long way of no guessing, of complete understanding, not just, you know, throwing shit at the wall, hoping some of it sticks. I think you'd be shocked. It's the NFL. How many, I don't want to say incompetent, how many people are in roles that they have no business for? And then it eventually shows for us when we're watching the games. I'm a partner at a wealth management investment firm that management that manages assets for wealthy families. I love my job, but the worst part is dealing with those that didn't do shit to earn it and yet expect everyone to treat them like they, uh, like they did. So your take on Jonathan Kraft couldn't be more relatable. As a Cowboys fan, I have nothing to look forward to considering we got bounced in the first round and our team has only gotten worse. Is there any moves you can see Jerry making that would give us any optimism for the next two or three years? Also, if this makes it on the pod, please don't say my name. Didn't say his name. It's funny, you know, because let's just say your dad made a lot of money. You spent a lot of time around your dad. 
it just becomes like through osmosis, I am my dad too. And we've all been around these people. And I've been around people on both sides, people that act like you would never know the kid and the kids that just are fucking like, are you serious right now? What Jim Harbaugh say about Ryan Day? Born, you're born on third base, homie. Some people were born at home plate. And listen, you, you can't control who your parents are. I, I could have been born in, you know, poverty stricken area somewhere around the world, or I could have been born in, you know, Manhattan. My dad's a billionaire. It's all out of all, all of our control, but it is in your control how you operate and how you think. And, you know, Jonathan Kraft to me, I, I just think you can see this coming from a mile away. I would say with Jerry, I think the best thing at this point in time, why resign Dak? Why extend Dak? You're already under the cap with his massive cap number. Play it out. If that happens again, we got to make a different decision. But this notion that you have to extend him, he, he's better than mediocre, but he's slightly above that. When you, when you sign guys like him constantly, and then you complain, and it, it wasn't his fault you lost to the Packers, even though he did not play well. The defense was abysmal. I mean, it was probably one of the worst defensive games of the entire playoffs. Actually had to be the worst, thinking about it. I just think you hope you nail some draft picks. You got Micah Parsons. You got some good defensive linemen. You got some good DBs. You got Dak. You got CeeDee Lamb. Maybe hit on a running back. Hit on another offensive lineman. And just hope your team... I mean, Jerry's drafted well. You probably have some young players you've never even heard of. Most of you didn't know who Bland was two years ago. So they do a good job in the draft. And uh, hope you don't shit the bed in the playoffs. <laughs> And part of it would be maybe Mike Zimmer, the defense a little better, especially in big spots. But your roster's kind of your roster. I don't expect some huge, like all of a sudden, Tyree kills on the team or something. So you just got to hope he hits on the draft picks, which if you're going to defend Jerry for one thing, he hits on picks. So if, if you could land several starters and impact players, maybe a couple of your practice squad guys step up and make big make big steps which has happened a lot for you guys over the last several years. You guys can be very competitive. But at this point in time, let's face it, we're all judging on the playoffs. McCarthy's in his last year. Can't be getting be you can't be getting bounced in the first round as a massive, massive home favorite. It can't happen. And it's also one thing to lose, another thing to get your ass kicked. One of the worst playoff losses in a recent memory. I'd say the worst playoff loss in the last five years got to be the Bills. I mean, they're up with 13 seconds left. You can't lose that game. You can put the Cowboys right up there. You really could. They, they find a way to win the division, get a home game. Jordan Love comes in and drops. If you said, John, what was the score of the Cowboy-Packer first-round game? It feels like it was 75 to 10. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that, that's what it feels like. I mean, seriously, it feels like 55 to 14. I, I don't know. I feel like the final score was actually like 44 to 25. But it felt much more like, yeah, 55 to 7, something like that. And Jerry, you trust. 